the team in Aleppo for this very good field trip. I hope you've enjoyed this and uh, see how important it is, uh, the work that's being done on the ground. Uh, I think it's, it's so important to see how we're able to uh, make a difference despite the global uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. I felt I was back in Aleppo, this beautiful city in the north of Syria. And I hope that this uh, trip has helped you get a better idea about UNICEF's work in Syria through these excellent colleagues that we have on the ground. So, so members of the press, colleagues, friends, uh, thank you for coming to this press conference. UNICEF is very grateful for your interest that has been with us over the years. For the past decade, you, uh, the members of the press corps, have been part of the extended UNICEF family through ongoing coverage on the impact of this brutal war. Uh, and you've been able to raise attention. You've been able to help us advocate. Uh, you've been able to make us make a difference. 10 years, it, it's a whole decade, it's a half a generation. It's, it's beyond belief that this has been going on that long. Uh, this has been a war that has had a staggering impact on every single child from Syria. When the, the war first started, uh, I traveled with a group of emergency directors to Syria and at the time, we aimed to expand humanitarian action in Syria by conducting the first cross-line mission. As you know, Syria pre-2011 was a middle-income country with almost no humanitarian response. So we had to gear up. Uh, and yet none of us at the time thought that the war would go on for 10 years. And yet here we are, this beautiful and diverse country that is Syria has been riddled by one of the most brutal wars in recent history the toll that the fighting has had on millions of people, including more specifically its children, on the mosaic of the social fabric, on the economy, let alone on the infrastructure, including basic services is tremendous. Let me give you a few uh, points of information or data that could be useful. So firstly, last year has been exceptionally hard for Syria's children with the triple effect of the ongoing war uh, the economic crisis and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, inside Syria, there are 6.1 million children in need of assistance today. This is an increase of 20%. It's 90% of Syria's children. The price of the average food basket, what, what a family eats every week has skyrocketed in the last year, it has increased over 230%. And according to the latest estimate, more than a half a million children on the age of five in Syria suffer from stunting as a result of chronic malnutrition. Uh, we saw the catch up education program going to kind of more formal education. One in three schools can no longer be used because they were damaged, destroyed, or are being used as shelters for displaced families or in some cases being used for military purposes. Let me turn to the issue of uh, the fighting and specifically to the issue of children directly affected by conflict. So according to the latest verified data between 2011 and 2020, more than 12,000 children were verified as killed or injured. Uh, the numbers are, are unfortunately much higher, but this is the direct reports we've received. More than 5,700 children, some as young as seven years old, were recruited into the fighting. And nearly half of these 5,700 children served in combat role in the front lines. And more than 1,300 education and medical facilities and personnel came under attack. The war is, is leaving a heavy toll on children's mental health with both short and long term implications. One in four children are now displaying, displaying symptoms uh, of psychosocial distress. And this is double what we had last year. Now, I want to I wanna zoom in on one situation of particular concern, the situation in northeast of Syria. You know, I visited northeast Syria in December. I visited Al-Hol camp. And I want to say that the living conditions in the camps are, are appalling. And while we continue to deliver services there, this camp is not where children should be. Um, uh, there are 41,000 children in Al-Hol, including Syrian children. 
of these 41,000 children, there's nearly 27,500 children from 60 nationalities. Um, and these uh, children should not be there. They should be uh, at home with families uh, in their uh, communities or countries of origin. So there's, there's a lot of terrible things that have happened for children over the last decade. But I also want to say that there is hope. Uh, my main message to you today is that the children of Syria are far from being a lost generation. Through Syria's children, including the Syrian children that we saw in the videos today, we learn about courage, we learn about perseverance and resolve. The determination of children to learn, overcome the odds and build a better future is admirable. During my several visits to Syria, I witnessed this firsthand. It's mothers telling us consistently that the most important thing is to get their children education, no matter where they are, who controls the territory where they live, because that's the future. It's children like Saja, who we saw at the beginning, who never gives up despite losing her leg. She continues to play football, as you saw, and she wants to be a sport teacher. What, what she told us is we cannot let a moment, she cannot let a moment define her life. So we should continue supporting Syria's children where, wherever they are, inside Syria, in the neighboring countries that have done so much and beyond. And uh, if you allow, let, let us turn to a, a second part of the vir virtual visit to Syria. This is a, a trip that will take place to the neighboring country of Jordan, and then we'll have an opportunity to discuss and, and go through your questions. Uh, thank you very much. Back to Hello, the video. Everyone. Camp has thank you to our teams in Jordan for this uh, excellent field trip. Uh, uh, colleagues, UNICEF in Jordan has expanded its operation in response to the refugee influx very early since late 2012 as uh, the influx of refugee continued. Uh, our teams continue to be there in the camp, as you saw, and across the host communities to deliver aid and assistance to children. And like in Jordan, we have teams in all of the host countries, including Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq, and, and Egypt. The number of refugee children in neighboring countries has increased more than tenfold since the beginning of the crisis, the 2.5 million Syrian refugee children since 2012. And Syria's neighboring countries, uh, the countries I just mentioned, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, Iraq, Egypt, uh, have borne the brunt of this uh, outflow, uh, despite having their own challenges economically. Uh, these countries host 83% of the total number of Syrian refugees around the world, putting a strain uh, on them and their services. And this generosity, this open door that people and government in Syria's neighboring countries have shown is exemplary uh, and it's not to be taken for granted. You know, despite everything, economic crises, political instability, uh, this generosity has never stopped. It continues a decade on. Uh, and Syria's neighboring countries themselves uh, need our support more than ever. I have to say, I'm specifically concerned that Lebanon gets support. Lebanon is going through a very difficult situation. You remember the explosion uh, in August. Uh, and we very much in Lebanon are working not just to support refugee children, but of course, the needs of Lebanese children, uh, including through the public education system that caters to both. So again, like I did last time, let me give you uh, a couple of pieces of information uh, on uh, uh, some of the results in this case uh, of UNICEF's work. Um, and this includes our work inside Syria and in neighboring countries. So with UNICEF's support over the last year, nearly 900,000 children have received routine immunization of vaccination against measles. Over 400,000 children have been reached with psychosocial support. I saw a question about that. Uh, much of the videos that you saw, both in Jordan and in Syria, and it would be the same in Lebanon, and Turkey, wherever we would take you through this virtual field trip, focuses on the importance of education and learning. And we've been able, with UNICEF support, to access 
over 3.7 million children uh, who have benefited from formal and non-formal education. Overall, 5 million children are learning as we speak today, and each of those is a ray of hope. Uh, we've been able to support 5.4 million people with access to safe water through improvements to water supply system, as you saw in Zatari. And in response to the COVID pandemic, we reached 55 million people with awareness raising materials, health measures, distributed personal protective equipment to frontline workers, including masks, robes, and face shields, and uh, are supporting the countries to get the needed vaccines uh, and get beyond the issue of vaccine uh, nationalism. So what does it all mean? Uh, and uh, where do we uh, go forward? Um, I mean, thanks to all the efforts from partners, governments, dedicated personnel, civil society, partners, and of course, teachers, we continue to have 5 million children who have access to learning. Uh, and this is an example and an indication of the joint efforts. Uh, you know, without the work, without everyone coming together, we would have uh, virtually no children uh, learning in Syria and around Syria, no Syrian child learning. Uh, and we would be at risk of a lost generation. You know, in, in, the, in the coming years, we will continue to focus on, on learning. We will continue to focus on uh, responding to COVID, including uh, the delivery of vaccines. We will continue uh, focusing on psychosocial support uh, to children and keeping them safe from violence and harm. Returning to the COVID-19 situation for a moment, um, let me just say that uh, we with WHO uh, and uh, other organizations are a member of the COVAX facility. And one of the key things we'll be doing in the weeks ahead is making sure that we facilitate the equitable delivery of vaccines in across Syria, including in the Northwest of Syria, and that we support host governments, uh, including in neighboring countries with reaching priority groups, including those among refugees. Uh, Jordan is in fact, the first country in the world to start vaccinating refugees. Uh, all of the neighboring countries have included the refugees in their plans. Uh, we need to make sure the follow-up happens, that this is operationalized, that the vaccines go from frontline workers to people with underlying conditions to the elderly uh, and so on. Um, uh, we hope all countries hosting refugees will follow suit. Um, and uh, we, 